Okay, so here we have a very simple direct current circuit. We just have the one resistor, the one battery, and I've included a switch here that at the moment is open. Okay, so the question is, what is the current running through the circuit at the moment I throw the switch closed? So if I close the switch, current begins to flow. What's the current? Okay, and in the first half of the semester when we began describing these circuits by moving charges and currents and then as we built up into direct current circuits, we learned about Ohm's law, which tells us that V equals IR for a standard resistive circuit like this one. Okay, so we just rearrange for the current, and the voltage divided by the resistance is the current, and for the moment we were happy with that answer. Okay, uh, and in the last couple of weeks or so we've been discussing magnetism and magnetic fields, and particularly how magnetic fields interact with moving charges or currents. And so now we should begin to be a little bit uneasy about this answer because that's not everything that's going on inside this circuit. We also have magnetic effects. So this is a current carrying wire. And what do we know about current carrying wires? Well, current carrying wires create magnetic fields in the direction given by the right hand rule. So if we point our thumb in the direction of the current, the conventional current, coming out of the positive terminal of the battery, our thumb goes in the direction of the current and our fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. So the B field does something like that. Now last time we talked about Faraday's law, and Faraday's law says that for a loop like this one, when we have a change in the magnetic flux through it, that we're going to create an EMF because of that. So we know, for example, that this magnetic field that starts out as zero, and when the current begins flowing, then the magnetic field arises because of that. So we have a non-zero change in magnetic flux per change in time, and that's going to create an EMF of its own in the wire. So that's going to be called the induced current. And I'm going to label it for the moment E epsilon sub L. So what about the direction of that induced current? And that's where we use something called Lenz's law. So Lenz's law says that the direction of the current induced is going to be such that the magnetic field created by that induced current is working opposite the change in magnetic flux per change in time that caused the induced current in the first place. And that's a very long, confusing chain of ideas. So let's go through it once more. We have the current coming from the battery going this way, creating magnetic field swirling around like this. Okay, and because of Faraday's law, that induces a current of its own in the wire, this EMF, epsilon sub L, and epsilon sub L is going to go in a direction such that the magnetic field created by epsilon sub L will subtract and not add from the original change in flux that caused the induced current. So which way would that go? That would go in the opposite direction of the B field. So we know that this B field is getting bigger and bigger as the current begins to flow. So d5 by dt is going to go in the same direction as b, and that means that if we do the right-hand rule, we want that to go the opposite way, and the induced current has to go in the opposite direction of the original current. This effect is called self-inductance, and for very obvious reasons, this induced current that works against the original EMF it's fighting against the EMF of the battery, it's called the back EMF. Now, recall that we can write the magnetic flux phi b as b dot a, where b is the magnetic field and a is just the area vector of the loop that we're considering. And that can be written as b times a times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And so if we think about d phi by dt, if B changes, we get an EMF induced. If A changes, we get an EMF induced. And if that angle changes, we get an EMF induced. And that's what we talked about last time with Faraday's law. So inside our simple circuit that we were considering a moment ago, what's changing? What's changing to create that EMF? Or what is d phi by dt going to be proportional to? Well, the area of that circuit isn't going to change. The orientation of the B field with that circuit is given by the fact that there's the, the current running down the wire in the first place and that B field is circling around like this, so it's always going to be 90 degrees. The cosine theta term is not going to matter. Whatever you do with that circuit, because the B field is created by that current, then the cosine theta term is not going to matter. It's not going to change, uh, rather. So it's not going to play into d5 by dt. 
So B is the only thing that can affect D5 by DT. And we know that the magnetic field is proportional to the current, and that the flux is proportional to the magnetic field. And because of this, we can say that D5 by DT is proportional to the change in current per change in time. Also notice that we switched to a lowercase i, so it's a variable current now, because we know that the current is going to be changing with time. So we're not going to be using the uppercase, which is like a constant current, but i for a variable now, lowercase i. So because of this right here, we know that d5 by dt depends directly on di by dt, the change in current for change in time. And so we can come up with a name for this proportionality constant and call it L. L is going to be a quantity which we call the inductance. Now, if we compare this expression right here to Faraday's law, remember that Faraday's law says that the induced EMF is equal to minus d phi by dt for a single turn, and then that's going to be minus L by di by dt. Also, it so turns out that for a coil, for a coil, that the inductance can be written as the number of turns times the flux through each turn divided by the current. And this turns out to be a very um, useful expression for solving problems. And we have a name for this object, for a coil, that behaves in this way whenever we use it as a circuit element, and that is an inductor. Now notice that we can start from this expression for the induced EMF, and we can write that the inductance is minus epsilon sub L divided by di by dt. So this can also be written as epsilon L upon di by dt. And notice that the change in current per change in time turns up in the denominator in the expression for inductance. So when you think about what an inductor does and what this quantity of inductance actually tells us is that the bigger the change in current per change in time, the smaller the inductance and vice versa. And that means that what an inductor effectively does is smooth out jumps in the current change. So whenever the current tries to change quickly, the, inductant, the inductor smooths that out. It sort of makes the entire circuit more sluggish. Um, so if you can imagine the circuit that we had before, when we throw the switch on, it doesn't go up to that V over R immediately. It slowly increases, the current slowly increases to V over R. Now, it's exactly that property that makes an inductor able to store energy inside a circuit. And the amount of energy stored by an inductor in a circuit is a half times the inductance times the current squared. So for that reason, it functions a bit like a capacitor inside a circuit in that it stores energy, but it does so in an entirely different way because with a capacitor, we had those two plates looking at each other. And as charges built up on both of those two plates, opposing charges, uh, we created a voltage, a potential difference because of that. And so there's no charge being stored by this thing, but there is energy sort of being stored for the circuit. And that's UB is a half times the inductance times the square of the current. I'm not going to go any farther on justifying why this is the case, but we're just going to go ahead and use it to solve problems. Now let's do some of the example problems. So in the first one, we have two coils, and we're trying to compare the inductance of one to the other. Coil B is twice as long as coil A and also has twice the number of turns. So do we think it's A that the inductance is B and B is twice as big as the inductance is A? Is it four times as big? Is A actually twice as big as LB? Or are the two equal? So this is not a very difficult problem if you know the equation for inductance for a coil. But it could be... Um, it could be a guessing game if you don't. So the best way to do this one is to go ahead and jump to the reasoning first, write out the equation for the inductance of a coil, and then just see what it is. So recall that the inductance for a coil, L is given by N phi B over I. That's the number of turns in the coil, the flux running through the coil divided by the current. We know that N is twice as big for B as it is for A. So the only wild card here is the flux. Just like whenever we had Faraday's law problems and the real trick was accounting for d5 by dt, whenever we're calculating these inductances, the trick is going to be finding out what the expression for flux is going to be. Now recall that we can write out magnetic flux as b dot a, that's b a cosine theta, and then what actually is this area term right here? 
Well, if we have a coil, that area is the cross-sectional area. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the length of the coil. So even though B is twice as long as A, that doesn't have anything to do with the inductance. So N is twice as big, that means the inductance is going to be twice as big for B, and the length doesn't have anything to do with it. So the correct answer is A, that LB is twice as big as LA. Next we're going to find the inductance of a toroid. And so our toroid has a major axis R and a minor axis lowercase r, and we're going to talk about what that means in just a second, tightly wound with n turns of wire. We're going to model that toroid as a long solenoid, uh, the magnetic field rather of the toroid as a long solenoid. So basically we can think about the toroid as a solenoid bent inward on itself. And then we're going to show that the inductance of the toroid is given by this expression here, one half mu naught n squared r squared over r. So a toroid is a sort of donut shape. And so we're going to look at a cross section of it like this. Just like we've cut this thing in half. The cross section of the toroid is of course circular, and then the toroid itself is circular. So the major radius is the radius of the toroid itself, from the center of the toroid to the middle of one of its branches. And then the cross-sectional radius is the minor radius. So the problem says we can model this toroid like a solenoid, and that means we can write out the inductance as n phi over i. Now just like in the last problem, we need to write out what phi is. n phi is going to be b a cosine theta. But that's just going to be b a, because the cosine theta term is going to be 1. By the right-hand rule, the magnetic field created by each turn in the torus is going to point straight down the torus. Next, we should think about what the cross-sectional area is. And the cross-sectional area is that little area right there. And clearly that's given by pi times the minor radius squared. Now we're not quite ready to substitute this expression into the inductance just yet, because we don't really know what B is. What's B? Well, if we recall from chapter before last, that's going to be mu naught times n over L times I, the magnetic field for a solenoid. And notice I'm being consistent here and using the lowercase variable I. So we can substitute that in, and that's going to be mu naught n I lowercase r squared over L. Now we're still not quite done because we need to think about the length. And the length is going to be the entire length around the toroid. That's going to be the circumference of the circle created by the uh, major radius. So length is going to be 2 times pi times the major radius, 2 pi r. So we can substitute that expression in here. And I had a typo before, I forgot about that pi. So we're going to throw that in there, throw that in there. Obviously the pi's will cancel, and we're left with mu naught n i lowercase r squared over 2 capital R. And then lastly, since we know what the magnetic flux is, we can take this expression and substitute it in right here now. And if we do that, we get L is N, next comes phi, which is this entire expression, mu naught N I R squared over 2 R. All of that over I, and that I is going to cancel. And what we get is 1 half N squared, because there are two Ns. Mu naught stays where it is lowercase r squared over r, and let's check and make sure that that's the expression we were supposed to get. One half mu naught n squared r squared over r.